Okay, we're all set. All set, Matthew, take it away. All right. Good evening, everybody. And thank you for joining today's webinar uh, titled Regulating Private Speech, Sign Regulations and the First Amendment. We hope this webinar is of interest to those watching and helps us all better understand the regulations surrounding speech and signage. My name is Matthew Smith. I'm a planner at the Tug Hill Commission. Uh, for those who may not know, the Tug Hill region covers 2,100 square miles in portions of Jefferson, Lewis, Oneida, and Oswego counties. The commission is a small, non-regulatory New York State agency that provides technical assistance in the program areas of land use planning, local governance, community and economic development, and natural resource management. A couple of features of the webinar. For the webinar, you are muted and your video is turned off to conserve bandwidth. Please enter your questions in the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen, and we will try to answer them throughout the presentation. Uh, now it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker for tonight, Mr. Mark Cuthbertson. Mark is an attorney focusing his practice in commercial real estate, land use, municipal litigation, and the representation of municipalities and not-for-profit cemeteries. He received a Bachelor of Science from Villanova University and a law degree from the Albany School of Law of Union University, where he was an executive editor of the Albany Law Review. Also, he is familiar with municipal government, having spent time as assistant town attorney and planning board member for the town of Huntington. He went on to be the longest serving council member for the town of Huntington, having served in that capacity for 25 years. We welcome Mr. Cuthbertson and thank him for his time. My pleasure to turn it over to you, Mark. Thank you. Thank you, Matthew. And thank you to the Tug Hill Commission. And thank you for all the uh, attendees. I really was very impressed when I got the roster today of all of the people who were uh, Zooming in tonight. Um, and uh, I was really honored to be asked to do this and really looking forward to uh, this until 9.30 last night when the Yankees ringed out and I found out that the game was being played at four o'clock. Uh, we'll give you, uh, those that care, we'll give updates every once in a while. I think that at last uh, note, it was about the fifth inning and the Yankees were up four to one. Uh, but I, I will uh, take a couple of breaks here and there to take questions. And um, you can put those questions in the chat. I wanna give you an idea of what we're gonna cover tonight. First, uh, we'll start with a, a quick overview of the First Amendment, talk about the difference between commercial and non-commercial speech, talk about um, the uh, leading case that, that brings us here from 2015, uh, Reed, uh, the Reed case. And then after that, talk about a case that, that really dialed back a little bit on the holding in Reed, which is Reagan National uh, v. the city of Austin. Uh, then we'll take a look at some cases illustrating some uh, usual pitfalls and sign ordinances and some ways to avoid them. Then uh, my favorite section is takeaways, some things that you can take away from uh, tonight's presentation and hopefully bring back to your municipality if you're looking to amend your sign code. And, and also look at some typically problematic types of provisions. Not going to spend a lot of time there but then uh, point you to some really great resources. And there are, I wanna emphasize that, there are terrific resources out there. If you are looking to draft a, a new sign code, there are all sorts of model sign code ordinances out there and they can be very, very helpful. Uh, title of our presentation is, uh, just gotta, is City of Austin v. Reagan National. Read uh, really doesn't mean read, and we'll get to what the meaning of that is throughout. Uh, I started this, I, this is not my first lecture on billboards and signs and the First Amendment. I started this probably 17 years ago when I litigated uh, a, a First Amendment case involving billboards in the Eastern District of New York. Uh, and that was a three or four day bench trial and it piqued my interest in the First Amendment and uh, in particularly billboards. But I, 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 so the first outline I ever did on this, I included this, the, because when we think of signs, we, a lot of people, the older ones among us, think of this uh, lyric from the sign song, sign, sign, everywhere a sign, uh, blocking out the scenery, breaking my mind, do this, can't do that. I'm sorry, I can't sing. Can't you read the sign? But it begins with the, the phrase, and the sign said, the long haired, freaky people need not apply. 
And I thought that was just a, a great lead in I, I, when I when I did this. My, my wife laughed and was like, it's so cliche, it's so bad. I wouldn't include it, but I did anyway. But I, I did get a little revenge a year or two ago when um, there was a follow up to this that I enjoyed. And that was uh, someone put up this sign. The, the employee shortage is so bad that long haired, freaky people can now apply. Uh, and and I, I really got a chuckle out of that uh, when I saw it. Um, Read the Town of Gilbert is uh, we're going to talk about that. Its importance really stems from the fact of um, its focus on content based sign regulations. So content being the actual substance of what the sign says, what's in it, what is it saying, and the problems that it pre presents when you attempt to regulate uh, the content of uh, a sign. It's the most definitive and far reaching Supreme Court case on day to day regulation of signs, uh, if, probably ever. Um, First Amendment itself, uh, every, a lot of people are familiar with it. Um, First Amendment provides in relevant part that Congress shall make no law abridging the freedom of speech. Um, the uh, day to day real life, um, the, it's a lot more nuanced than that. And there's a lot of jurisprudence out there that's notoriously complex. Um, and I think there's also in, in the United States, we sometimes uh, confuse First Amendment values and, and how we value free speech in, in our interactions and the actual First Amendment. We think about, and I, I think about my cra crazy Uncle Vinny, who's on Twitter. And, and Twitter has taken him down and, and, and Instagram has taken him down. And he says, I have a First Amendment right. How can they do that to me? And I have to explain to crazy Uncle Vinny that, you know, Twitter is a private platform. It's not a government run platform. And he's not a state actor. Um, so in order for there to be a First Amendment implication, there has to be a state actor. Twitter's not a state actor. He's not a state actor. Um, so the First Amendment doesn't apply. But we, we have a stronger sense of First Amendment, uh, I, I think, in this country than it, than it actually reaches. So uh, it's important to, to dial down and say, OK, yes, that the, the First Amendment applies to localities such as towns and villages through the 14th Amendment. Um, and that's why the, you're concerned with the First Amendment when it comes to drawing up your sign regulations and also your day-to-day -day interactions with the public. Uh, there, there often can be a uh, public forum and other many, many other First Amendment um, uh, uh, implications. Uh, so the type of speech that is involved is going to tell us um, the, 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 the context of that speech. It's going to tell us the type of scrutiny uh, that the Supreme Court is going to require. The, the most important type of speech that the First Amendment covers uh, is non-commercial speech, uh, political speech, ideological speech, um, those type of things. And, and, and for the government to abridge uh, the, the right of people to speak in that content, in that context, um, uh, and, and, and to, to regulate that type of content, they, they're, there has to be a very compelling government interest. And what, what that's called when the government looks at that type of speech is strict scrutiny. And in order to survive strict scrutiny, um, you have to put forward a, a compelling government interest. And that's very hard to do. Very often, the invocation of the term strict scrutiny means that a particular regulation is going to be struck down. Intermediate scrutiny is uh, something in between that and rational basis. And most commercial speech is, is governed by intermediate scrutiny. And it just says that there has to be an important government interest, not a compelling one. And the means by which you regulate have to be substantially related to that interest. So, um, so commercial speech and non-commercial speech are the two we see most often. Uh, and they are regulated in that way under that sort of rubric. Um, so as I said, law that, that discriminates based on viewpoint or content of the speech uh, are subject to strict scrutiny. This is the highest level of scrutiny. Commercial speech, again, uh, generally subject to intermediate scrutiny. The leading test for um, commercial speech is the central Hudson test. Uh, it, it just says that the in the first instance, a uh, the speech itself can't be 
uh, unlawful or misleading. Um, if you want to regulate, you have to su serve a substantial government interest and directly advance that interest, and it can't be more extensive than necessary to serve the interest. Leading case on billboards is a case called Metro Media. Um, it's one of these crazy Supreme Court cases that there often are. There were five different opinions. Justice White wrote a plurality opinion that basically now is um, recognized as the majority opinion and uh, was very, very difficult for people to understand and, um, and get their arms around. And it's taken 30 years to do that, but it's, it's recognized for among other things, allowing municipalities to completely prohibit commercial billboards. Um, um, I, the, the, among the things uh, in Metro Media was that the, the, the court said that, okay, you know, things such as traffic safety and um, aesthetics are uh, important government interest and you can use those to regulate billboard signs. Um, the, the Metro Media case became a lot more complex in 2015 when the Supreme Court uh, issued this decision in Reed uh, that radically changed the definition of content-based. Uh, the controlling case, uh, this is Reed v. Town of Gilbert, was, uh, was handed down in 2015 case centered on a sign code for the town of Gilbert in Arizona, which prohibited outdoor signs without a permit, but exempted specifically 23 categories of signs. The three categories at issue really in the case um, apply different rules to different types of signs. So in the case of Reed v. Town of Gilbert, ideological signs um, that, 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 that you, you were communicating a certain message or idea, but wasn't political necessarily, uh, can be up to 20 square feet, no zoning or time limits. Political signs, on the other hand, had a different treatment. They could be a different size and different timing on when they could be put forward. Temporary directional signs, which were the ones that uh, Pastor Reed in uh, uh, Reed v. Town of Gilbert wanted to put up, uh, had a completely different set of rules. They, could, they had to be smaller and they, they had different time limitations. So as I said, I alluded to the petitioner in this case was a church pastor who posted signs on Saturday mornings to advertise Sunday services and then removed the signs by uh, midday Sunday. The location of the Sunday services changed every week because the church did not own a permanent home. Town cited uh, Reed's church sign for violations. I guess he, he left them up too long or they weren't the right size. I, I frankly forget what it was, but that's Pastor Reed there. Uh, with his famous sign and for his Sunday services. And he actually retired to live with his daughter in Arizona and, and proselytize. That's what he wanted to do in his retirement and be a pastor. And that's what he did. And uh, the, the local town uh, took him to court. He sued. Um, law, the, the read, it's amazing to me that Town of Gilbert, Gilbert's sign uh, regulations were upheld by the trial court, were upheld by the... Um, the second level, the Circuit Court of Appeals. Um, and among the things that they said was Gilbert did not adopt its regulation of speech because it disagreed with the message conveyed and the interest it has uh, in regulating the signs were unregulated to their content. That's what the lower court said. Supreme Court, and this is a pretty amazing, unanimously reversed. So that means everyone on the Supreme Court, conservatives, liberals in between, were in agreement with this decision. That doesn't mean that they were uh, unanimous in the decision. The decision, which I'll get to, has, uh, has a, um, concurring opinions, a majority opinion, um, but no one <coughs> dissented. So there were no dissenters in this case. They all agreed that um, <coughs> uh, the city's, uh, the town of Gilbert's sign regulations were a problem. Um, the court wrote, uh, the Supreme Court in the majority opinion uh, said, that the, the sign code was facially content-based uh, due to how it defined the sign categories and the restrictions in the code that apply to any given sign depend entirely on the communicative uh, content of the sign. And you could see that uh, before, political signs were treated different from, differently than temporary directional signs. 
Um, and the court wrote in the majority that a law is content based on its face is subject to strict scrutiny, re regardless of what the government's motive was here. And you couldn't see any um, malicious motive uh, or that none could be uh, divined from what was going on. Um, there was no, they, they didn't, you know, dislike the church or dislike politics. Um, these were all, you know, appeared to be um, not directed with any animus at, at anyone, but because they weren't contract neutral on their face, uh, they, they were problematic. Um, the, the, the court specifically rejected the argument that a sign regulation does not censor, if it doesn't censor or favor a particular viewpoint, um, it can't be content-based. Um, the, again, the, since the code singled out specific subject matter and specifically uh, non-commercial subject matter for differential treatment, um, uh, it, 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 it ran afoul of the uh, Constitution and the First Amendment, um, uh, even though it wasn't singling out a particular viewpoint. Uh, and, 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 and predictably, once the Supreme Court held that strict scrutiny applied, they found that the justifications that you would have uh, uh, you know, such as traffic safety or aesthetics. In this case, they said the justifications holding uh, directional signs, that directional signs are no less impactful when it comes to a traffic safety uh, or an aesthetic uh, point of view than political or ideological signs, but they were being treated differently. Um, uh, court concluded in the majority, and the, the majority was written by Justice Thomas, uh, that by that that specifically rejected a concern that will be made by the concurring opinions that the decision would render virtually all distinctions in sign laws subject to strict scrutiny, and we'll get to that. Um, Justice Alito, who is a, a conservative justice, Kennedy, who's who's gone, and Sotomayor, who's viewed as a liberal justice, um, all issued a concurring opinion, and that was written by Justice Alito, and Justice Alito attempted to lift a list, what he called a non-exhaustive uh, list of the types of sign regulations that would still be permitted under read and would not be content-based. Notably, you know, lighting uh, when it comes to things on-premises and off-premises specifically said that that distinction uh, in a sign code would not be uh, viewed as content-based. Um, Justice Kagan, Breyer, and Ginsburg concurred in the judgment only. <coughs> they did not concur in the decision. Justice Breyer is an interesting duck who you'll hear from later. Um, in a separate concurrence said, you know, that content discrimination is better considered in many contexts, um, it, that there shouldn't be this automatic trigger when, when in this case, when you read a sign and you look at content, um, but that it should rather be a rule of thumb. And he'll talk a little bit about that um, uh, Justice Breyer also cited to a lot of other instances, uh, and this is in the, his concurring opinion, in the U.S. Code, for example, SEC disclosures, FDA disclosures, where you have to look at the content of what's being proposed, whether it's the, you know, statements that are required to be made um, by uh, companies when they go to the market, or labeling of food, and, and the, that specifically those things look at content. So uh, they, that First Amendment wasn't a problem in those cases, so why should it be here? Um, Justice Kagan wrote, I wouldn't call it a blistering uh, concurrence, but she, she said that what the majority was doing here just went too far. They didn't need to go this far, and, and, and they frankly went too far in what they did. Um, they, 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 her concern uh, and, and, and others, the concern of others was that you were probably going too far and now strict scrutiny was going to apply too much. <clears throat> and what would probably happen is that people would be confused by that or strict scrutiny would get watered down. She had a great quote and she said, I suspect this court and others will regret the majority's insistence today on answering that question in the affirmative, uh, the way they framed it. As the years go by, the courts will discover that thousands of towns have such ordinances as the one in Reed v. Town and Gilbert. And as the challenge to them mount, uh, the court may soon find itself the, the veritable Supreme Board of Sign Review, that, the Supreme Court and other courts, um, that being the case. Um, so, and, and she said that 
um, and, and that the, the, she articulated why the court didn't need to go that far because she said that it didn't pass strict scrutiny. Um, so they didn't have to make this all encompassing ruling. She said it didn't pass strict scrutiny, didn't pass intermediate scrutiny, and it didn't even pass <coughs> the laugh test when it came to Supreme Court jurisprudence. So um, I'm gonna take a break at this point, because we'll talk about reading its aftermath, and I'll just check the chat and see. I think some of these things are going to be tough. Sure. No, I'll, I'll can, see what uh, I can answer. Facilitate. Oops, sorry. I can facilitate yeah. some of the questions in the That'd chat great. if you'd like. Okay, great. Okay, so just briefly, too, uh, I wanted to mention again, if anybody has questions, please put them in the chat. Um, but we have a question from John. John asks, can a ZBA put restrictions on religious messages on a sign for a commercial business? No, I wouldn't think so. I, yeah, that, that would be very problematic. And I don't know what role the ZBA, that'd be a, um, yeah. So no, I, anywhere, and we'll talk about this later, anywhere there is going to be um, a commercial message, there should be able to be a religious message. Um, and and, and the, the, that would be very problematic uh, and would be a First Amendment violation if a ZBA um, put that sort of restriction. I, I don't hear much. I mean, I guess the ZBA has the ability to make conditions on its, um, its uh, decisions. So I guess it could be a condition conceivably. But no, that would run afoul of the First Amendment. OK, and that's all the questions that we have for right now. All right, great. Uh, just exit chat. Um, so, <laughs> read really. Um, I, I, it's it's difficult to to do justice to how far reaching and how problematic read was. There were over, I think, at current count, there were over two hundred forty law review articles trying to make sense of what Reed said and what that would mean for the First Amendment landscape. Um, and in, in 2017, there are cases after that, uh, that 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 directly got to the question of, okay, does does read really mean that if I have to look at the substance of the sign and read its content, that uh, that uh, automatically triggers strict scrutiny? <clears throat> there was a case from the D.C. Circuit in 2017 called Act Now that basically got around that and said, no, we don't think that's the case, and came up with a rationale about why that it didn't apply under Reed. Um, uh, the, and it, it, the court found that the rule did not target signs communicative content or reveal even a hint of bias or censorship um, and does not depend in, in trying to figure out and look at the location of a sign uh, does, does not require you really to depend on the content of the sign's message, which is a little, uh, you know, it definitely goes against the grain of, of what Reed says. Now, there that that was one point of view after Reed. The other point of view was articulated by uh, the Fifth Circuit, which is a more conservative circuit, in a case that did make its way um, to the uh, to the Supreme Court. And the Fifth Circuit said, "No, we're going to take um, you at your word, uh, Supreme Court, and 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 we're we're going to." Um, take what Justice Thomas said at his word. And after all, he's the majority opinion. And even though Justice Alito said, well, the on-premises, off-premises distinction is, is okay, according to Justice Alito, Justice Alito's decision was only a concurrence. So that doesn't count, and we don't have to pay attention to that. In Reagan, the plaintiff was a billboard operator who sought to digitize its existing non-conforming, excuse me, off-premises signs. Uh, City of Austin denied the permit um, as it would change the existing technology used to convey, convey an off-premise message uh, <clears throat> and increase the degree of non-conformity. So they, they were saying that if you went digital, basically, that wasn't grandfathered. And you, those, the, the, that the, the billboard signs in the city of Austin, which is a great city and I love to visit, were, were basically grandfathered. And if you increase the um, non-conformity, um, that, that that's not grandfathered and they wouldn't give you a permit for that. Uh, plaintiff sued, alleging that the sign regulation was unconstitutional under Reed. District court denied the, uh, that and the petitioners appealed 
uh, uh, district court denied the petitioner's request for declaratory judgment and, and found that the sign code was uh, content neutral. Petitioners appealed and the Fifth Circuit reversed and court identified two substantive questions it needed to address to get to the question whether the signs distinction between off premises and on premises was content based and whether the sign is a regulation of commercial speech and therefore subject to intermediate scrutiny under Central Hudson. On the first issue, the court stated that if the regulation is facially content based, it's subject to strict scrutiny, regardless of the government's motives. Um, and it ultimately reached that point of view. It noted that while Reed did not profess to be creating new First Amendment law, federal courts have recognized that Reed constituted a drastic change in uh, First Amendment jurisprudence. It, it, and it noted that in their view, it abrogated um, many of its own prior precedents uh, that didn't say that if you had to read a sign, it was content based. Um, and it abrogated, among other things, the, the case of the Ward v. Rock Against Racism, which was a, a leading First Amendment case on time, place, and manner regulation of First Amendment uh, of, of, of content-based speech and regulating uh, speech based on content. Um, and and, and they, they kind of rubbed Justice Alito's uh, opinion back uh, in the, the face of, uh, uh, of the litigants saying, listen, they, they meant what they said. That wasn't the majority opinion. Um, and, and so ultimately concluded that the, to determine whether a sign is an off-premise or on-premise sign, you have to read the sign and ask, does it advertise a business, person, activity, goods, products, or services not located at the site where the sign is installed? So you have to read it uh, to determine those things, whether it's on-premise or off-premise. So in other words, getting back to the title of this presentation, read, uh, the case of read really meant read. If you have to read it, then it's content-based, then it's subject to strict scrutiny, then it's probably not going to pass constitutional muster. Um, uh, and, and again, um, the uh, aftermath of read, among the things was that, that some uh, municipalities and, and, and in fact states anticipated a problem with the on-premise, off-premise uh, uh, distinction and for example, the state of Colorado decided instead of distinguishing on <coughs> off-premises and on-premise, they were going to distinguish based on whether uh, a, a revenue type of test and uh, it, because they thought that on-premises, off-premises was going to get thrown out and they still wanted to be have the ability to regulate billboards. Um, I'm going to tee up. Uh, I, I, so then the case makes its way to the Supreme Court of the United States. And uh, I, I found it, it, it is helpful uh, if you're a Supreme Court nerd to listen to um, the oral argument. And, and I thought both Justice Breyer's um, uh, concerns that he had before when we talked about the Reed case and the questions he asked, uh, <clears throat> they were fo both funny and, and brought uh, uh, an interesting uh, it, colloquy to bear. So let me play that for you to start. And this is Justice Breyer. And, and interestingly, I didn't know this, but I, I, I listened to a podcast about this. The justice chuckling in the background is Justice Thomas, who often laughs at, laughed at Justice Breyer because he's now retired and thought he was very, very funny. So this is Justice Breyer during the oral, oral argument for uh, City of Austin v. Uh, uh, Regan. All right, so uh, I'll tell you why we let the, uh, home, the, the my own kale shop. I sell fried kale, uh, and right outside, I want a big picture of kale that lights up. Okay, it's mine. This is my shop. I want to decorate it the way I want. A strong interest. I don't have the same interest in what the billboard. 40 miles outside the town says about my kale shop. Okay, there's your difference. And uh, the grandfather is because we love grandfathers. Okay, there we are. And uh, that's historic. You go back to the year two, you'll discover those kinds of distinctions. So they're distinctions. And uh, therefore, I have to get to the content based. And now I'm back at just 
this question. Content-based? Hey, the whole SEC is content-based. And what about the infinite number of FDA rules that say you better disclose how much sodium there is? That's not content, sodium? It isn't, it's salt. But salt, by the way, is a kind of content. And it's not good for you. But uh, regardless, regardless, FDA, SEC, try the energy world. You better disclose, Mr. Smith Energy, uh, how much coal you're burning. Okay? And we can go on through the whole U.S. code. So as you know, my conclusion is this makes no sense. It does make sense in the context of where you're trying to do time, manner, and circumstance. It does make sense in the context. So that was Justice Breyer. Um, And he really hammering home the point that strict scrutiny uh, analysis, it shouldn't be dispositive in this case, that that there has to be a a, a better way to go about that. Um, The justices... um, in some in some of the questioning, despite their reservations about whether it was content based, the justices seem to agree that Reagan's proposed rule could have a significant impact on existing laws and the multitude of sign laws that exist in municipalities throughout the country. In particular, in the the Reagan case, the the United States um, uh, the solicitor for the United States argued and was very concerned about uh, a, a federal act called the the Highway Beautification Act that has a lot to say about uh, how billboards can be regulated along federal highways. And and it was clear uh, that that Justice Roberts noted that if if they applied Reed in the way that Reagan National was asking them to do so, that uh, five of the provisions on the Highway Beautification Act would be unconstitutional. And that would really set the world of billboards, uh, highway billboards on fire uh, and into confusion. Um, Justice Kavanaugh, <clears throat> he, he was very interesting too. He seemed particularly torn. Um, he, 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 despite questions suggesting that the city could address its justifications through a different means, um, he, he said that th- this decision um, was going to be around for a long time to come, and it, it really was going to have uh, a, a significant impact, and they had to be very careful in how they went about this. And 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 kudos to him; he was very concerned about what this was going to do um, when it came to uh, people who are planners trying to figure this out, and people who are local officials trying to figure this out. And I'll pay, play you um, and just a, a small snippet of the oral argument where he asked a question. And and the context of this is the 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 attorney for um, the billboard operator here, Reagan, is saying, oh, listen, you can, de- you can um, decide this very narrowly and it, it won't have a wide ranging impact. Please, you can find it my way. Uh, that helps my client. Uh, and, and, and it won't be this all encompassing ruling. And this was uh, Justice Kavanaugh's reaction to that. Makes this a very easy case. I don't think that the court needs to tackle the task of defining how its test for content neutrality <laughs> would apply in every conceivable context. <clears throat> Mr. Shannon, in my client's favor. As you well know, people will pay close attention to the opinion. <clears throat> and unlike some of our decisions, this decision is going to affect every state and local official uh, around America. And they spend a lot of money and a lot of time trying to figure out how to comply with the First Amendment implications of sign ordinances. So I, I, I'm just going to push back a little like, oh, this is a nice, easy, narrow case. You look at the amicus brief of the Planning Association, for example, I thought it was pretty telling about Metro Media. It said uh, experts have spent decades intellectual wilderness disagreeing about metro media their debates leave planners in the same wilderness yet under the cover of night with no flashlight or map Uh, you know that that's a pretty evocative way to describe what we potentially would be doing so i think we owe some clarity that doesn't mean you lose or win i'm just saying the idea of oh we can just kind of do a little narrow thing i'm not so sure so i I thought that was a a very interesting colloquy and and, and tremendous understanding on justice kavanaugh's part uh of you know obviously and i think once you're on the supreme court you realize how important your decisions are but but particularly when he brought home 
the point uh, that was raised by the, uh, the planning association, the American Planning Association, who were an amicus, and there were I, dozens of amicus to this case, I'm sure, um, and raising their concerns saying, listen, it took us forever to figure out Metromedia. I mean, and that was five different opinions and and we need some clarity here. Um, and, and Reed was was not clear and, and creates a lot of problems for municipalities. And, and there was certainly a recognition by the Supreme Court of that when it made its decision. Uh, so let me get to uh, the substance of the decision. Um, the Supreme Court reversed the Fifth Circuit's ruling an opinion by Justice Sotomayor. Uh, they they explain that read uh, that to read uh, to mean that a regulation cannot be content neutral if its application requires reading the sign at issue is too extreme an inter interpretation of read. So the the so-called read uh, need to read rule um, uh, uh, that 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 shouldn't be the rule that gets applied. Uh, Justice Sotomayor said that it was a very different regulatory environment. In this case, it's off-premise versus on-premise is the, the limited thing that you're looking at there. Uh, in, in, in Reed, there was a very different uh, context in which there were, as we saw before, a differentiation between all sorts of non-commercial uh, signs. Um, and they're not, uh, she goes on to write, the city does not single out any topic or subject matter for differential treatment. Uh, it's it's distinction only rests on the location rather than on any of the content. And because of that, it's not subject to strict scrutiny. I mean, there are people out there um, that have criticized the majority opinion already saying, I, I don't see how you can say that with a straight face given what the Reid opinion was without in some part overruling uh, the, the Reid case, but uh, it was not overruled. Um, they highlighted in the case, a case from my neck of the woods on Long Island, um, uh, Suffolk v. Uh, Suffolk Outdoor Advertising Co. v. Hulse, uh, which is in the town of Southampton, and, and, and talking about that the on-premise, off-premise sign distinction is really similar to ordinary time, place, and manner restrictions. So important to note that, right, regulating something on content is very different than regulating something based on its time, place, and manner. <clears throat> so where a sign can be located, um, uh, the, 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 the time that a, a sign might be out, um, the, the manner in which it's illuminated, those are all the type of the laundry list that, that Justice Alito gave in the uh, Reed decision were the, the type of, or, or types of time, place, and manner restrictions. And, and that, that, that Justice Sotomayor was saying on behalf of the majority that uh, this was closer to that. Um, uh, I won't go through, I, I just, my head spins a little, Justice Alito, uh, his reasoning in, in his concurring opinion in this, but I won't go into it. So it's, it's a lot esoteric. Um, I do want to play, because we're going to shift gears. Let me take a break and see if there are any questions that have uh, I don't see anything new in the chat, so I will keep going. Um, and and just a, a little local, um, something that happened locally here that I'll go into, I just want to preview it with a, a video uh, that hopefully you'll be able to see. Stay happy. Oh, uh, with the hold on one second. I forgot that I have to, I have to stop my share. And then I have to share again so you can see this video. Um, see that the Yankee game is up on one of my screens. Uh, no, that's not it. Oh, uh, boy. Oh, there it is. That should get me there. Sorry for the technical issue. The ruling that came down from the, the judge in the local court. A sweet victory for Rogers Frigate, an ice cream and candy shop in Port Jefferson. The shop was cited for violating the village's sign code for banners like these in favor of former President Trump and against former Governor Cuomo. But a judge ruled in favor of the sweet shop, saying that, quote, the speech at issue is pure speech of a political nature on the speaker's own private property and clearly protected under the First Amendment. I feel personally 
that there has been selective prosecution when it comes to these banners. Vinny Sider, speaking on behalf of the shop's owner, said they've had many banners up for years and didn't have trouble with the village until the signs became political. But the village attorney says it had nothing to do with the message. It had to do with the type of sign being a prohibited. The village attorney tells Newsday they're going to reevaluate the sign code and change it if necessary to comply with the court's order. The village is also appealing the judge's ruling. While it sounds like they do have a leg to stand on, I'm hoping that another Trump sign doesn't come up for any political, actually any political sign comes up because it's very divisive. It's a free speech, whatever you, it's their, their business. They want to hang a sign. It's up to them. Not hurting anybody. Cecilia Dowd for Newsday TV. We are very, very happy uh, with uh, the ruling that came down from the, the judge and the local. And stop my share and share again. Uh, don't know. Oh, yeah, we're right. Okay. Uh, so I, I think that it just. We're to, very, very oh, happy. Sorry. Uh, okay, there we go. Um, I, I think that's just an interesting way, you know, of, of how people, when it comes to signs, look at it. Um, I will talk about that decision uh, in a little bit um, because, uh, it, you know, the last woman said, well, it's his property, it's his sign, he has a First Amendment right uh, to do what he would like, and <clears throat> not quite that simple. But to be honest with you, the lower court, the, the village justice in that case, sort of wrote an opinion to that effect. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about that in a second. Excuse me. The I think that something just to think about too when it comes to regulating signs and your exposure as a municipality is um, if in this case, that particular case, obviously the not obviously, but the the village wrote um, violations and they went to village court and those uh, violations were dismissed because, uh, they violated uh, the person's First Amendment rights. And, and not a lot of exposure there if you're the village regulating. More exposure if the person brings you to federal court and says that your, um, your, your code is unconstitutional because then your exposure, if they're successful, are attorney's fees. So something to bear in mind is if you're looking to update your code, worried about it being challenged, far worse to have it challenged in um, federal court because attorney's fees are an exposure. Someone has their hand raised and I don't quite know what to do with that. Uh, we request that anybody that wants to ask a question, put it in the chat, please. Okay, great. Um, all right, uh, 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 the case that uh, also down from my neck of the woods is uh, people be on-site mobile opticians. I think it's an interesting case involves a, 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 a and it shows, and, and this, what I want to do is just talk about some of the pitfalls that you can run into with sign ordinances. The defendant in that case was charged with placing advertising, sign advertising their opticians business on public property, right? So in the code and a lot of codes out there, it says you just can't put your signs in public rights of way. Um, <clears throat> they're um, the, in, in that case, uh, the appellate term, which is uh, the lower court said, yeah, no, you're convicted. What they did was wrong. Um, here, um, there was uh, a, there was- hey, Mark. A, yeah. Sorry. Oh. Can I just have you, can you put the slides back in presentation mode, please? Okay, sure. Let me, uh, hopefully I know how to do that. Uh, huh. No. Uh, oh boy. Okay. Let me see if I. Uh, you said that was view, right? No slideshow. Yes, and then you can do from current slide. Oh, uh, from current slide. We good? Uh, I'm not seeing anything. Oh, because no, screen sharing has stopped. It said. To Okay. There we go. Now we're all set. Thank okay. you. Thanks. Um, yeah. So in this case, there was a problem with uh, Brookhaven's code that had nothing to do with this commercial advertising sign. 
Um, but the, 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 the property owner or the optician's attorney raised this other issue. And they said, because of that, the, the whole sign ordinance of the town of Brookhaven should be struck down. And normally uh, that wouldn't be the case. You have a severability clause, but <clears throat> there uh, wasn't a severability clause. Uh, other case law that would support this so uh, the, 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 the ordinance itself was struck down and the, the violations were uh, th that they, 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 the property owner escaped any sort of liability. Um, I, just a couple of signs that are post read signs, uh, cases. Um, there was a sign code that had an exclusion for religious symbols. Um, and, and that was the only thing that, that, that you could have uh, in a certain context, only religious symbols um, were, were exempt uh, from certain types of sign regulations. And they, they, the court in that case said, no, that's no good because you're treating political symbols uh, worse than that. And, uh, it, and, and case is interesting. Uh, the site is there uh, if you wanna do that, uh, look at that. Um, Palmer v. City of Missoula, uh, balloons were examined as commercial speech under the Central Hudson, but the state court, court states the approval for the fact that the balloons with non-commercial messages could be as restrictive <clears throat> as those with commercial. And the point of that is, and we'll get to that in this Port Jefferson case as well that was on that video, um, you can still regulate certain types of signs uh, in, in the commercial and non-commercial context as long as you regulate them all in the same way. So you can say balloon signs are prohibited, both in the commercial and non-commercial context. You can say that those uh, blade signs are uh, illegal, both in the commercial and non-commercial context. Um, and there's another case that, that talked about the Reed decision. Um, I wanna get the decision. Uh, I'm just gonna step away for a second because it's another part of my office. This Port Jefferson case, uh, which I can, if you have any interest in it, uh, it, not the world's most interesting case, but, you know, basically in that case, the judge uh, said, okay, well, in, in, the, in the case of Port Jefferson, they said that across the board, you couldn't have um, streamers, spinners, pennants, whirly gigs, inflatables and banners and other things, right? So the, in this case, they cited the, the, the owner who was on the TV before uh, because of his banner. And um, the, <clears throat> the lower court uh, or the village justice court just said, well, the first amendment protects uh, free speech. Uh, you can't abridge free speech. The sign code abridges free speech, uh, therefore uh, it violates the first amendment. The, the no discussion of commercial, non-commercial, no discussion of all of the nuances that are out there um, and, a, a, and a pretty um, uh, simple view of the uh, First Amendment, and I think wrong, um, uh, but uh, interesting to see that application locally. Um, takeaways, uh, and you, uh, I'm sure you've been waiting for this after this long-winded uh, law school discussion of cases. Um, if you look at Reed and its aftermath and, 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 and credit to this law review article that's out there that, that came up with this list of what, uh, what, what are the things that really were uh, impacted as a result of the Reed decision. Um, number one, avoid unnecessary content, content and context-based distinctions. Um, uh, two, avoid unnecessary exceptions. Um, rather than referring to real estate, political, or garage sale signs, treat all these yard signs as yard signs, residential district signs, something generic that's not <coughs> referring to their content, even uh, in the context of an exception. Uh, commercial advertising is subject to intermediate scrutiny, and you shouldn't be afraid to be able to uh, regulate it. You know, dealing with a lot of the issues and the problems and pitfalls uh, of the regulation of non-commercial signs versus commercial can be handled with a, with a simple sentence. And it's called a substitution clause. And it's language that can be as simple as signs containing non-commercial speech are permitted 
anywhere that advertising or business signs are permitted uh, subject to the same regulations, or you could say as commercial signs. Those things, you don't, you could define them if you want to define them. They're defined pretty clearly in Supreme Court precedent. Uh, and that's what they would look at in that context. You can certainly still ban billboards. And uh, Long Island, you don't see a lot of billboards. I don't know about up in your neck of the woods, but ban banning billboards is, is very much still permissible. You can regulate by zoning districts. And so you can have certain sign standards uh, and you see this a lot in downtown areas, there's certain sign standard, there's certain aesthetic that's required. Um, you can do that. You have to, again, put commercial and non-commercial on equal footing, but you can, you can discriminate by zoning districts. Um, <clears throat> you can prohibit private signs on public property, absolutely. You can regulate time, place, and manner, which can include illumination, size, and form. Um, your government interests, uh, should clearly be established. So when, if you do uh, redo your code and you have your uh, legislative intent, uh, the more that you can have in there, the more that a court can look to when it says, what is it that you were trying to achieve? Um, you always should have a severability clause. Um, and that's something as simple as saying, if any part, section, subsection, paragraph, subparagraph, sentence, phrase, clause, term, or word of the code is declared, uh, Un, it, that should be unconstitutional. Uh, man, I don't know how I let that mistake skip me. Uh, is is it is in violation uh, that such a uh, violation won't affect the validity and enforceability of the remaining portions of the code. Uh, I can send you if you need a severability clause that. Um, so I, I'm going to finish. Uh, with just looking at two things, uh, which is type of sign codes that might be problematic. This is from up in my neck of the woods uh, or down in my neck of the woods in village of Patchog. Uh, so they, they clearly have, you know, they define political signs, historical markers, and they, they, they distinguish between them. And then they um, uh, have different regulations. Uh, again, holiday decorations are treated different than other types of things. Um, so those are the type of distinctions that would be a problem. East Hampton, I won't go into that. Um, uh, I, I think in terms of possible solutions, and I want to go to, I'm going to go skip to the end and then go back. Because um, these, I think uh, there are a couple of resources here that are really terrific. This um, Montgomery County online, uh, its planning commission has a model sun code ordinance, and I grabbed from that. And it's terrific. And if you needed a starting point between that and this New York Division of Local Government Services uh, publication, which is online as well, Municipal Control of Signs, that does a great job of saying, how is it that you should go about looking at your sign code and trying to revise it? Um, the Montgomery, Pennsylvania one uh, does a great job, but it also has a model sign ordinance that I think is, is really good and, and, and is really looks at trying to get at this content neutrality issue and avoid possible violations. So back to that, just grabbing from some pieces of that, you know, I think it starts in part with um, the, what they do in this, um, um, this model code from Pennsylvania, they, they have really specific A through Z definitions of signs. So, you're not left to guess at what type of sign there is, and it's specific. <clears throat> and the more specific I think you can be, the better. Digital display, and it goes through um, the gamut. And then in the exceptions, it has very tight what I what I would consider very tight exceptions. You know, so you know, holiday decorations are exceptions. Signs and and not any type of you know whatever holiday it is. It's generically holidays, um, personal expression. Is, is, is exempt and is not a sign, official traffic sign, things of that nature. So it, it has very uh, discrete exceptions that don't rely on content, but rather rely on uh, the type of, of sign uh, that it is, whether it's holiday or government. Um, and flags, it deals with flags. Uh, so it, it, in the exceptions, it's very helpful in that respect. And uh, I will say also in it, 
that, that it does a good job of segregating between the types of signs. So it, it, it looks at sign regulation when it comes to temporary signs and, and pole signs and those types of things and very specific. And, and I think that really helps when it comes to um, the ability to regulate signs and, and, have, and have a workable sign code. And it also uses graphics, which I think are terrific because I, I, I don't do, I don't do a lot, I have to admit, when it comes to sign applications. Usually there are local people that do that and, and there are lay people that do that. And, and, and I, what I often have found when it comes to signs is there's one zoning inspector in the town uh, that's in charge of signs and it's, it, it can be a pretty arcane code and they're usually helpful, but it, it can become a real guessing game. And they, unfortunately, they probably have more power than they should. Uh, and when the code is more specific and uses graphics, people can look at it and say, okay, that's what they mean. That's what my expectation is. I don't have to be at the whim of the sign inspector who's made an interpretation that this is this type of sign and that's that type of sign. Problem, you know, the only problem is it's a lot of work um, to, to redo your sign code. So, uh, but these model codes are, are terrific uh, and very comprehensive and, and easy to read and well thought out. I'm going to go to the, that is the conclusion of my presentation. These are some resources uh, uh, that are helpful. There's tons of stuff out there, but I found these particularly helpful um, in the chat. Uh, okay, um, thank you very much. Yeah. Um, we just had one question, I believe. It comes from Christine. Um, she asks, will you discuss what constitutes fighting words or threatening words? Yeah, I, I have to be honest, I'm not real good with that. Um, I can get you something, but off the top of my head, that's not, a, 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 you know, a, an area uh, that I'm strong on. And to be honest with you, uh, it, it becomes real fuzzy what's a fighting word and what's not. It's same thing with obscenity, because I love obscenity. So when in the, in the law of obscenity, you know, the Supreme Court has been clear that child pornography and, quote, hardcore pornography are not protected by the First Amendment. Uh, things below that, it gets into uh, whether it meets a definition of uh, uh, of obscenity, and and there's a case, uh, there's a test out there from the Supreme Court on obscenity. Uh, that the name is not rolling off the tip of my tongue, but if that's of interest to you, I can send you the penal code section and uh, the the provisions of law that apply to that. Okay, thank you. Our next question uh, comes from Dennis, and they ask, can time limits on election signs be enforced? Yeah, I think they can, but I, bearing in mind that, you know, elections happen for various things at different times. So I, I think if, if you tie it to an election, and it's the fire commission election, and we have them in December here, yeah, it, it rotates around the fire commission date. But then, right, <clears throat> then we have primary elections and general elections and school board elections. So I, I think you can you can tie it to an election date and that there it's enforceable. Um, I, you know, it's uh, obviously with how um, signs these small signs have proliferated and how low cost they are. Um, it's it's difficult. And and, and with that said, uh, you know, then you have certain signs that that you see on a roadside that maybe oppose a local zoning project, right? Well, let's, let's stop uh, whatever it is that the, the, the assisted living facility that they want to put down the street. Um, is, is that an election sign? No, it's not an election sign. So can you have time limits on that? I, you, you might be able to come up with um, uh, a methodology for that, but you, you can't treat, you, you couldn't treat that, um, well, I, I think in the political context, since you tie it to an election, the time limits work. The question is, what's a workable time limit for an ideological sign? And, and maybe the ideological sign that's there is, you know, uh, stop war or, or whatever the message is that's not tied into a time period. So, and, and the answer may be out there in these model sign codes that deal with that, but, but you certainly, the, the long-winded or the, the short answer to your question is yes you can have time limits on election signs. And I think that is workable, but it, right, you know, just a whole host of other signs that, that don't lend themselves to time limits are the problem. 
Okay, thank you. Uh, and then we had another question uh, from Alicia. And they ask, what is the difference between a sign and a display of personal expression? I mean, a sign, a sign is what you define a sign to be, right? So in your zoning code, you're, you're going to have to meet certain criteria for it to be a sign. You know, that in that, in that what falls into uh, the definition of a, a sign for local code purposes, it, it, certainly your the content there can be something that is personal expression, and that personal expression would be non-commercial speech, and it would be regulated as such under your code. So it's still just because it's personal expression doesn't mean it can't be regulated. So in the case of the, the hearkening back to that uh, village of Port Jeff video in that case, that person's um, personal expression was uh, impeach Andrew Cuomo, I think, and something favorable to former President Trump. The problem with that was his mode of expression was a banner, and that type of sign uh, was a sign that was prohibited. So even your personal expression is that it can it's not completely unfettered just because it's your personal expression. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have one more question from Adam. They ask, has there been any case law regarding camouflaging of commercial speech within ideological speech? And the example that uh, they gave is God bless America and shop at Joe's. You know what there is there when they're intertwined it becomes more problematic right um so it's and there are cases out there that deal with that i so i, I don't have the direct answer to that but it certainly has um been treated i my 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 and not a great recollection is that um uh if, if it's more so for the purpose of conveying a, a, a commercial message, I think it gets viewed as commercial. Um, but again, if you wanna email me offline, I can probably dig something out that, that gives you some guidance on that. And I think my email was in the beginning of uh, this, not, uh, yeah, it's there. So it's in the beginning. If you have an email, I'm happy to answer a simple question or two or send you a resource, um, always, after being in local government for 24 years, we all need to help each other out and, and do what we can for one another. Well, actually more than 24 years because I was an assistant town attorney, but uh, I'm happy to help. And, uh, I, you know, in this context, and there are a lot of great uh, resources out there, including those resources that I cite to <coughs> um, that may may have uh, the answer. I'll go to the end again, because that New York one um, had the, the, those things I was talking about before. Uh, when it came to um, uh, obscenity, I, I, I got uh, that from the um, that New York uh, Division of Local Government Services. So that had a whole discussion of alcohol and tobacco signs and um, uh, uh, signs with adult uses. And it may even answer your question that you had about um, uh, mixed message signs, commercial, non-commercial. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I don't see any more questions in the chat, um, but thank you so much, Mark. That was very enlightening, very helpful. A lot to take in, but interesting. Um, I appreciate you um, giving us your time and, and helping us understand this a lot better. Yeah, my pleasure. I really, I, I appreciate it. I love doing this. So, and, and uh, it was a lot of fun. I was really honored to, to be asked because I, I didn't realize how many people there were going to be and how important uh, the work that you do is. Uh, and uh, uh, a, a friend, David Fleming, who's an Albany uh, attorney, a lobbyist in Albany, had said he had worked with your commission on cemetery issues and how, how much he enjoyed and how, how great an experience it was. So thanks. I, I appreciate the chance to be here. Thank you very much. Thank you for everybody attending as well. Um, just a quick note, 
um, certificates will be sent out to people that have attended, if that is of interest to you. Um, and I think that just about wraps it up. So thank you again, Mark, and thank you everybody for attending. And a recording of this will be up on YouTube on the Tug Hill um, Commission YouTube channel that you can find through tughill.org. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to uh, send us an email. Um, and thank you again. Have a good night, everybody. Yeah.